Well, today we celebrate Trinity Sunday. And you know, I used to think that the doctrine of the Trinity was kind of a boring thing. Well, you know, everybody believes in the Trinity. How, you know, how exciting can that be? So I want to thank the Jehovah's Witnesses for making the Trinity a little more exciting. <laughs> because they're made up of mostly ex-Catholics and they reject the Trinity. And they attempt to do so on biblical reasons, which I find rather interesting. I've had some discussions with them and uh, it's kind of like arguing with a stop sign. But in any event, um, what they believe is they believe only the Father is God. So I believe in God the Father, that's it. So the, Jesus the Son is not God. The Holy Spirit is not God. So what do they believe? Jesus is the incarnation of Michael the Archangel. And I asked them, can you show me how that works in Scripture? How you come up with the idea that the Michael the Archangel became incarnate and a man and somehow uh, saved us from sin? And he says, well, we got a big book back at headquarters. It shows us all the answers. I said, well, why don't you study up and come on back and talk to me? Because when I'm at my house on my day off, they don't know who I am. And they come by and they ask me if I ever read the Bible. I said, as a matter of fact, I do. And uh, I'd be happy to talk to you about it. So, <laughs> so sometimes I have a little evil fun with them because uh, they have this passage where it says in the book of Proverbs, the dead are not conscious of anything. They don't know anything. And so uh, I say, so you guys believe that the dead in the next world, they're, they're not conscious of anything, right? That's right. That's what it says in Proverbs. And then I say, well, how do you explain uh, the teaching of the rich man and Lazarus and Abraham having a conversation in the next world? And he kind of got this funny look on his face. He said, no one's ever asked me that before. And I said, uh-huh. Why don't you go back to headquarters and check that one out, see what they got to say. So, and then, uh, you know, the, they, they attack the first uh, chapter of the Gospel of John, where it says the Word was with God and the Word was God. They have their own version of the Bible where they add the, the word a. Uh, the Word was a God, you know. So, and they come up with very, again, the idea that Michael the Archangel is, is redeeming us by becoming a human being and suffering, there's a problem with that. Okay, the angels were created by God. They are, they have a beginning, just like humans do. God has no beginning and no end. He is infinite. He's the only truly independent being, meaning he depends on no one else for his existence. We, however, are dependent beings. I mean, the country has the Declaration of Independence, you know, but the reality is, spiritually, we need to have our own little declaration of dependence on God, because we depend on God for our existence, our beginning, our continued existence. Our next breath and our next heartbeat is brought to you by the love of God. And so we need to get some gratitude in our attitude, and our nation needs to get a little appreciation in our nation, because we're starting to turn our backs on God. But in any event, um, the reality is the idea of God the Son becoming man, that's what we're celebrating at Christmas. The incarnation, God becomes a man. What does Jesus mean? It says in Scripture, God with us, Emmanuel. And so um, when, when you see in the Scripture, what does St. Thomas say to Jesus? My Lord and my God. So the whole idea is that God who is an infinite being, has become a man, and man has committed the offense against an infinite God. So in order to be able to atone for an offense against an infinite God, you have to have an infinite being making the atonement. And so the infinite being, God the Son, is on the cross. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and he is suffering for our sins, and that's how we get back into heaven. Now, um... One of the things that I have learned, you know, the Nicene Creed is a wonderful thing. First of all, we started out with the Apostles' Creed, and then they added at the Council of Nicaea all this stuff to hopefully refute the Arian heresy, which says that, you know, Jesus is not God. So the Jehovah's Witnesses weren't the first ones to come up with that idea. So, uh, but I think, unfortunately, it fails. 
I'm not saying I disagree with the teachings, but I think that the problem is they were theologians writing to other theologians. And the biggest mistake a teacher can make is not recognizing where their students are and attempting to teach them in a way that's above their heads. It's sort of like those guys at Microsoft, you know, they write the software and they think that, you know, people using it are also programmers and have that. Not, so, they, so they write it in such a way that you can kind of figure out some of it, but then the rest of it, you know, you're on the phone calling Microsoft, help, I don't understand, <laughs> how do I do this? Well, obviously somebody failed in making it user friendly. Well, I think that's kind of what happened with the creed. Because when I get people in my office that are Catholics for many years, or even people that are studying to become a Catholic, and I say, is Jesus God? They kind of get this look of fear on it. Uh, um, is the Father God? Yeah, yeah, the Father's God. Why do they say that? Because what's the first line of the creed? I believe in one God, the Father Almighty. That's fairly clear. But the problem is, when you get down to the next level, <coughs> it's, it, it says, I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ. It should say, I believe in God the Son, the, you know, the only begotten Son of the Father. And then they get into all this stuff, born of the Father before late, God from God, light from light, begotten not made, consubstantial with the Father. Is that clear? Huh? Did you get that? Did it kind of go in one ear and out the other? So I don't mean to be picking on guys that wrote this 1,700 years ago, but you know what? I think over the centuries, something got lost in the sauce. And the whole point of the creed is to show us what we believe and to review it. And people are reading the creed, and they still don't know that Jesus is God. I mean, it says it, God from God, light from light, begotten, not made. But how is, is it saying it real clear? So it should say, I believe in God the Son only begotten the Father. And it should also say, God the Holy Spirit. Because some people, is the Holy Spirit God? I don't know, Father, you tell me. You know, really? <laughs> You're saying the creed every Sunday and you don't know? Again, you know, these guys were, you know, kind of like Microsoft programmers. You know, kind of up there on their level, and they're missing the regular guy on this level. You know, and then the other one that gets me is, you know, they, they went and inserted the filioque phrase here, you know. Um, I believe in the Holy Spirit, who proceeds from the Father and Son. So, with the Father and Son is adored and glorified. So, the filioque phrase, they added that around 1,000. You know what we got out of that? We got a schism. I mean, is it really that important? Do I wake up in the morning? Wow, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. That's really relevant to my day. It's kind of a theological thing, isn't it? Was it the hill worth dying on? Was it the hill worth schisming on? You know, a thousand years ago, we went into a schism with the Eastern Church, largely over that being inserted into the creed. And so, I just don't think it was worth it. So, again, I'm Monday morning quarterbacking the creed today, but... You know, I just think that they could have done a better job teaching. So yes, the Father is God. I believe in God the Father, and so should you. The Son is God. I believe in God the Son, and so should you. And I believe in God the Holy Spirit, and I hope you do too, despite the creed. Okay? So what does this mean? Well, again, getting back to my Jehovah Witness who I had a fun argument with, he tried, I, I talked to him about the Trinity, which is three persons in one nature. What does that mean? Well, who am I? I am Father Burke. What am I? I am a man. So who answers the name of the person? It's, it's the identity. What answers the question of what is your nature? So it's a distinction between nature, what someone is, and person, who they are. Now, as human beings, we have one person, one nature. But God, the most advanced being from which all other beings in existence come, you know, God's way above us, like higher than we are above an ant crawling on the floor. So God is three persons in one nature. And it's a bit of a mystery. We can only understand it partially. So he used what he thought was his best argument. Well, Jesus is praying to God in the ag in the garden. I said, no. I said, God the Son, who is incarnate and the Father is not incarnate, he's not in flesh, is speaking to God the Father. 
as a man. So we describe it as praying. So he's, he's, he's talking to the Father, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not my will but thine be done. He says, well, that doesn't make sense. I said, because you're trying to limit God to one person and one nature as you are as a human being. I said, but let me ask you this. Do you have a child? Yeah, I have a son. And does he share your human nature? Well, of course. Well, okay. So if God the Father has a son, is he not going to share the divine nature? as we humans share our human nature with our children. And so he kind of, he said, I never, I never thought of that one before. And just, just to have a little more fun with him, just to annoy him with the whole thing about the dead are not conscious of anything, bring up the transfiguration when Moses and Elijah are there talking to Jesus, and that, that's another good one. That gives him a headache. So in any event, um, so we need to understand that the Trinity is three persons, one nature. So we use analogies. My favorite analogy is the water analogy. So what does that mean? Well, you have clouds in the sky. They have the form of gas, but the substance is H2O. So you have, uh, that is the substance. Just like with God the Father, the substance is divine, but the person is the Father. Then you have water, right? So water is liquid, but the substance is still H2O. And you have ice at the North and South Pole, or in your drink, in your martini or whatever, you know? So there's ice, there's solid, but the substance is the same in all three. So you will find in one of my books, um, I have a, a thing called Creation Sings the Trinity. And I go through all the different three. So three primary colors, I think yellow and, and blue and, and red make up all the rest of the colors. Time, past, present, and future. You know, we live in a three-dimensional world. Length, width, and height. So there's a lot of threes running through creation, which I believe is the fingerprints of the Holy Trinity. Even that water analogy I made, H2O. So that is the most abundant molecule on the planet. And so it's, it's, it's uh, three elements, you know, hydrogen, two, and, and oxygen, one. So H2O. So um, what about the soul of man? How are we the image of the Trinity? And what does it say in Genesis 1? Let us make man in our image. So you see the plurality of persons in the very beginning. It's not, I will make man in my image, okay? Because we believe in one God, but we believe the one God has three persons in one nature. So what about us? Well, I try to use the computer. We understand a computer, we can understand a little bit about ourselves. So the computer's made up of what? You got the power supply, the hard drive, and the motherboard. The hard drive is the memory. We have a memory in our mind. Our, our, you know, memory is who we are. And, uh, you know, I have a mem member of my family that's getting Alzheimer's. And so when I go to see him, I'm glad he remembers me, but much of his memories are gone. So our memory is important. It helps who we are and identity. So the knowledge that's in the hard drive, then you have the motherboard, which would be like the intellect. The intellect is the part of our mind that processes the information, where we reason and, and logic and make decisions. And so also the power supply, which runs the whole thing, is like the heart. The heart is where our will is. That's our power supply. So we can kind of, we, we make a computer sort of in our image, but we are made in the image and likeness of God. So the reality is, you know, we, we can understand again part of the mystery, you know, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So you're, you're touching on some powerful mysteries there. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So you've got that, uh, the mystery of the Trinity that we're just beginning to delve into and understand. So when we pray, what do we do? We start out in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, which combines the symbol of the cross. We're making a big cross over ourselves. And we're also <clears throat> doing what? In the Gospel of Matthew, what does it say? Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. So when we pray like that, we're sort of recalling our origin, the first sacrament, baptism, which is the gateway to the sacraments. So um, it's sort of like St. Augustine of Canterbury. You know, people used to be, you know, connected to where they're from, you know. 
So two, we're going back to our origin, to baptism. That's, that's where we have our beginning, the first sacrament. Baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And when we pray, we pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so that's the mystery of the Trinity, the names of God, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, that we recall each time we pray. And you know, we see it in the scripture, uh, excuse me, in the, uh, in the liturgy. Um, and so, for instance, um, when we sing the Holy, 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 where do we get that from? Why are we saying it three times? Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. It's Trinitarian formula. Where do we see it? Isaiah chapter 6. They sing and the angels cry out, Holy, 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 Lord God of heavenly hosts. You know? And we see it again in the book of Revelation. Holy, Holy, Holy. Three times. And in our, our Kyrie, right? Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. There's a little bit of a Trinitarian uh, aspect there. In, in the Confidior, through my fault, through my fault, through my grievous fault, three times. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace, three times. So we see a, a number of uh, sort of Trinitarian prayers running through the liturgy. So it's important for us to understand this. And, and the reflection of the reality of the Trinity comes into the design for humanity. I mean, one of the most noble titles a man can have is what? Father. And what about a mother, right? A woman, mother. We have Mary, our spiritual mother. The church is our mother. And so in the Trinity, God the Father, our Father who art in heaven, the commandments, honor your father and mother. And so there seems to be this attack, you know, the, the feminists don't like that. And I know for a while they had, sometimes they had changed the formula for baptism. Some of the other churches, the non-Catholic, and instead of baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is what Jesus says, you know, in, in Matthew 28, they baptized in the name of the Creator, the Redeemer, and the Sanctifier. And the church came out immediately and said that is invalid because that's not what Jesus said. We're initiating, I baptize you, I join you to, in this new relationship to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That's what happens at baptism. You don't go to functionality, create a redeemer, sanctifier. I mean, that's ridiculous. So we see an attack on the family, you know. God had an intention when he made the genders. He made them male and female, he created them. It's in Genesis. And so we have a father and a mother. And so the, uh, the genders are meant to be complementary, not, not to compete, you know, there's this whole, and there are role differences given by God between men and women, you know, and so this whole thing, trying to say we need to have women priests. Well, the priest is to be Christ. Christ was a man, God the Son, okay, he has a gender. And so um, the priest, is married to the church. So the bride is the church, you know, to, to try to adorn your bride with beauty, right? So I try to make a beautiful church, but on another level, of course, the church is the people. So my job is to adorn the bride, the church, with beauty, beautiful uh, souls who pray to God in Eucharistic adoration, pray the rosary, understand the scripture and believe the faith. So my job is to help you on the path to heaven to help make your souls beautiful, filled with the love of God and neighbor. And I will, of course, get to stand judgment uh, for that. Not necessarily looking forward to that day, but you know, you gotta, you gotta, gotta roll with the punches. Whatever's coming, we do our best. So the, what about the nuns? The nuns have those um, sort of robes they wear. That's their wedding dress. They're brides of Christ. They have a ring. And so it's a whole different role than what the priest is. So there's role differences. And so the world is often attacking the idea of the role of the father. We have God the father. And then we have our human father. So we have our earthly father and our heavenly father. And so the family is under attack. Even the words father. The word son and daughter, the word mother, you know? And so the modern world is attacking the creation of the genders and identity and the wording that is given by God, the creator. 
You know, he built it into nature. It's into science. And so, um, you know, the, the world, which often attacks us for not being scientific enough to their standards and their interpretation, doesn't seem to like the science of mother and father too much, do they? So this is the world in which we live, and we need to understand that we need to stand firm because the family of man is connected to the family of God. So through Christ and my baptism, I have my earthly father and my heavenly father, our father who art in heaven. I have my earthly mother who gave birth to me, and I have my spiritual mother, Mary. And then uh, through Jesus, the family of man is united to the family of God. So the church is the family of God. And so this beautiful union. And so we see uh, in the book of Revelation, Christ, you know, uh, is, is going to be married to his bride. You know, the Lamb of God is going to marry the church. So the church is his spiritual bride. And so the significance of that. So our, our spirit, our soul... What is our soulmate? On a physical level, you know, man and woman go together and they get married and have children. What is our soulmate? Our soul comes from the Spirit of God. It says in creation, God breathed into man the breath of life and he became a living soul. So the soul that animates our body, the soul that is us, wherein lies our free will and our ability to understand and think and reason and pray, to love and to hate, to do good and to do evil, to create and to destroy, all of that is our soul. And it comes from God. So when we are baptized, we are united spiritually with the God, the Holy Spirit. And so we want to keep that union that we get at baptism and, and it grows at confirmation and throughout a life of prayer and obedience and sacrificial love of God and neighbor so that when we finally get to heaven, the beautiful love between God and man. What does it say in, in the Old Testament prophets? Your builder shall marry you. So the, the, the beautiful love and St. Paul talks about how the marriage between a man and a woman, you know, and the love between a man and a woman foreshadows the love between Christ and his bride, the church. The, the beautiful love and union between our soul and the Holy Spirit of God, our true soulmate. So the mate for the soul of man is the Holy Spirit of God. And the incredible beauty and love and joy and happiness of finally being with God forever in heaven begins here and now, you know, in our life of prayer. And so the whole concept of the love of our family, our friends, the love of God, all being together in heaven. In, 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 you know, what is one of the most happiest times we have? Christmas. The family gets together at Christmas. We, we go to church, we celebrate the birth of the Son of God, the beginning of the redemption. God becomes man to save us from sin and hell so that the gates of heaven get open and we're happy to be together at Christmas. Well, that's a slight foreshadowing of the beautiful ultimate family reunion in heaven between God and man. Perfect happiness that will never end. And so part of the pathway to heaven is understanding and valuing the Holy Trinity, knowing that we have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so uh, this is what we believe and this is what we profess in the creed.